On today's episode of the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, we speak to Professor Nathan Lentz, an evolutionary biologist. He studied biology at St. Louis University and then completed his PhD at their medical school in pharmacological and physiological sciences. Now, PhDs need residencies too, so he did his postdoc training in cancer genomics at NYU. He loved New York so much that he stayed and is now a professor at John Jay College in Manhattan. He's the director of the honors program there. He maintains the Human Evolution blog, and his podcast is called This World of Humans. You can find it all at NathanLentz.com. We had him on the show today, and this is the first in a series, because he wrote a book called Human Errors, A Panorama of Our Glitches, From Pointless Bones to Broken Genes, where he discussed the beauty in our flaws. We are not the well-oiled machines that we think we are. And as physicians, we know that, but we don't always realize why. So in today's episode, we start by discussing how this book caused an unexpected run-in with the intelligent design folks, and then get into the cognitive biases and heuristics that help shape our reality, and how this, while designed as an advantage, can frequently be a disadvantage in our modern world. We then end get into the design flaws, like the vitamins that we should be able to make ourselves but can't, vitamins and minerals we absorb poorly or in the wrong place, and finally end on the paleo diet and intermittent fasting. But you'll have to listen to the end to find out which this evolutionary biologist advocates and why. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On today's episode, we have Professor Nathan Lentz, and we're talking about the book that I mentioned earlier. Dr. Lentz, thank you so much for being on the show today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. So your book focuses on all of the inefficiencies of the human body, or many of the inefficiencies of the human body. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't say all, (laughs) because I think you could write an encyclopedia of volumes and volumes about this. And I definitely didn't want it to to feel like an encyclopedia entries of just boring entry after entry. So I picked from a larger subset, I picked examples that really tell interesting stories. So it reads like a narrative. It reads like a story, not like a a series of, of small modules. So definitely not all, but I try to cover different ones throughout the body and mind even as a sort of primer. I think most of the chapters of the book could be their own books to, to really drill down. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's very comprehensive, but as complex as the human body is, I think it'd be nearly impossible to cover all of our flaws. Right. But I think you were surprised when this was met with some backlash by the, by the creationists, right? They felt that the human body is, is perfect as created by a creator, which came as a surprise. So there, there are some parallels there between that and as physicians, what we're encountering now with the anti-vaxxers, right? There's, there's this pushback that we see as unexpected, right? We didn't expect people to say vaccines are bad. So I just wanted, want you to tell us, one, what happened and how you handled it and, and in retrospect, what you would have done differently. Oh, oh, right. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I would do a lot differently. But yes, I, the reason I didn't expect anything is I just assume I, I, I'm very aware of the intelligent design movement and other sort of creation creationist versions. And I just assumed they would shrug and laugh and move on. I had no clue that this would catch their attention, but it definitely did. They started writing articles about it even before the book come, came out. Interestingly, in most cases, they didn't read the book. They didn't even pretend to read the book. They read articles about the book and reacted to it. So I, I think I wish they would have taken the time because I don't think that I say quite what they think I'm saying because <laughs> they really did attack the very notion that I'm calling things inefficient or bad design or what have you. But I also misunderstood them, to be fair. Their position actually isn't that the body is perfect and wonderful. What's odd, though, is that's how they, that's their problem with me, is me pointing out these imperfections. But yet when I say, oh, it's perfect, they're like, no, that's not what we're saying. We're just saying, you know, we're not saying it's perfect design. It's just intelligent design. So you have to really drill down a little bit deeper. And their, their position is actually a bit more subtle than I appreciated. So I give them credit for not being, I mean, they're really not like caveman creation type, you know, with, with no depth to it whatsoever. They do have a, 
an idea. I, I don't think there's any evidence for their position, but it's not as simple as, oh, no, look at how perfect the body is. It must have been designed. It's more of a they don't think natural selection and the other evolutionary forces could get what we have now. And at least at least periodically, a designer has to intervene with either with the preloaded information that gets activated. Some That's one version of, of their thinking or intervenes periodically and delivers new genetic information to allow evolution to proceed. It's a very convoluted thing to believe because it's sort of ongoing creation or ongoing miracles is what they believe, I suppose. It's actually very hard to figure what they believe because they're very good at saying what they don't buy, <laughs> what they don't buy into, but there's really, they're not offering any, any tangible alternative, certainly not any testable alternative. But I wouldn't compare them to the anti-vaxxers exactly because their opposition to evolution has been very steady going back a century and a half. And it's, it's zigged and zagged a little bit in, in its nuance, but it's always come from religion and it's always come from the idea that Darwinism is linked to the lack of religion or, or lack of religious belief, whereas anti-vaxxers seem to be a different thing altogether. And I, I, I know what you mean by the, the shock that the medical community is experiencing because vaccines have been one of the greatest victories of public health that humanity has ever come up with. I mean, it's almost innumerable how many lives have been saved by something so simple and so effective. And the fact that it now has opposition is just, it's just baffling <laughs> to me. Because to be honest, the evidence that vaccines are wonderful and safe is very easy to find. The evidence for evolution, I admit, you have to dig. It's not, it's not automatically apparent to you. That's why natural selection wasn't first proposed, at least in the West, until the mid-19th century. Because it isn't obvious. It is a little bit counterintuitive. So I can, I can admit that it's a bigger mountain for them to climb. But with vaccines, I mean, what the hell's the problem? It's really, that, that one's just, just absolutely baffling. So then what was it that you said you would have handled it differently? So what, what was it? Was it that you initially thought what I thought, that they were just completely against the the idea that there are flaws because it, it sounds like they're just they're against evolution in general like the back the fact that your book is based on the concept of evolution is right. the problem yes well no yes and no so the community is very divided so there are within the intelligent design community there are some who are perfectly fine with like common ancestry and evolution over billions of years and all of that they just think there has been divine direction in it or intervention and then there are others who doesn't think who don't think that any of that happened. So they're a divided community and I didn't appreciate that. But what I mean is I, what I've done differently is I immediately went into an argument mode with them and I was kept trying to clarify my position and, and therefore argue with them. And number one, that's just pointless. You're not going <laughs> to convince them of anything. It's a complete waste of time. And I should have more recognized that my audience in arguing is not them, but the other people who stumble in and, and read it. So this is sort of silent, readers. But my, the, the thing I would have done differently was I just wouldn't have engaged them at all. I would have just ignored and then they would have gone away after a week or two or, or I don't know. They, they, they do that. They, they, they're, they're baiting you. And I, I, I took the bait. Now, since then, I've taken a different approach with other projects that I'm on and I've thrown bait out to them that they, of course, greedily scoop up. And so I've been able to get them to look pretty bad in the process. But and, and, I, and I sort of regret doing that, too, because you're never going to convince them. They're very hardened in their opposition. So there's no, I mean, every time they bring a, a major criticism or something we don't quite know, and then there's a whole evidence comes out, you know, they just ignore that too. So you're not going to convince them of anything. So if I had to do differently, I would have ignored them. And they're really not worthy of, of engaging on this because there's really almost no credentialed qualified scientists who follow intelligent design. I mean, I, I, mean, I think you'd find higher more prominent people that are anti-vaxxers than you will intelligent design. I mean, it's really a movement on the ropes that has no, no science behind it. So I should have just ignored them. That's what I wish I would have done differently. <laughs> Although there, there is an argument that you're not arguing to convince them. You're arguing to convince the lurker. Right. You're exactly. arguing to convince the lurker, the person that's like reading the Twitter feed, if that's where you're yeah. deciding to have your argument, probably not. Yeah, the best that's exactly what I meant when I said the silent readers. And, and, and a friend of mine uh, who does a lot of this public engagement, that's the, what he convinced me of. He's like, you know, you're you sound like you're writing to them, but you're really writing to the audience of just, you know, the the parents of the middle school kid who 
comes home about evolution, you know, talking about evolution that he's learned in school and they're curious. So they Google some things like that's really your audience. The sort of really naive, earnest uh, people of goodwill who just want to figure out how to talk to their kids about some of this stuff, you know. So and not everybody has a background in evolution or uh, thought much about it. And so they might have been skeptical because of things they heard when they were kids, but they don't really know enough to talk to their own kids about it. So even if I, if I were to do it again, but still respond, I would have responded uh, with that in mind. So yeah, so I have some, some regrets, but not, not, I mean, nothing major. I didn't spend that much time on it. <laughs> I put on a few blog posts and stuff, but um, yeah, I mean, it's been, I mean, I think for a while it probably helped me sell a few books, but that was really brief. And, and at this point, I think I've been better off just not engaging. <laughs> so you didn't spend that much time on that, but you did spend a lot of time on the book clearly. So let's, oh, yeah. let's, let's, let's get into that. So the, the, really the goal of this episode is to help physicians understand why humans suffer from certain pathologies in order to give us a more in-depth framework for explaining it to our patients. Mm -hmm. So first, I just want to start off. So later, we're going to talk about more specific pathologies. But, but I want to actually start towards the end of the book. Mm -hmm. I want to start with cognitive biases. The, so this isn't really how the body isn't fully evolved, but rather how it's it adapted to survive an environment that was present 100,000 years ago, not our modern society. So so what first, what are some of the advantages of having cognitive biases and heuristics? First, well, actually, what are cognitive biases and what are heuristics? So heuristics is basically a shorthand that the brain uses to basically set up rules for interpreting what it sees. So when you're presented with information, whether you know it or not, your brain actually processes that information quite a bit before you're even consciously aware of it. And it makes decisions and it makes interpretations and that's what perception is. That's why sensation is just, you know, the raw signals from your sensory receptors of various types, sending that raw information to the brain. It's not ones and zeros, but we could pretend that it is. It doesn't mean anything on its own. Your brain creates meaning out of all of that electricity, essentially. And what that meaning is, we call perception, um, a whole lot of rules are built into it. Some of them are baked into your brain. And then others, the majority, uh, you learn through experience. And so, so babies, when they're first born, you know, they really don't perceive much as we think of it because your perception, just like everything else, requires a lot of input-output training. And so the babies have to see and feel and touch and hear for a long, long, long time before their brain really learns to do it well. Well, so heuristics are the process that happens underneath your consciousness in order for you to interpret what you're seeing, hearing, tasting, and all that without having to think about it, okay? So when you see, let's say, your friend's face and you do memory recall, right? You, you see your friend, you instantly recognize your friend. But you didn't say, oh yeah, that's because I know that her eyes are about this far apart and she has eyelashes and I, I remember that her smile could... You'd actually have a hard time describing what makes your friend unique from all of the other faces you found that day. But your brain matches that. And it does it very quickly. And if there's information that's missing, it fills in the blanks. So you could see your friend in profile or from behind even, and you have very limited amount of information, but your brain creates the rest of the picture in your, in your brain. So heuristics are just a, the brain's way of filling in the blanks with incomplete information based mostly from memory recall. But like I said, some of this stuff is, is baked into the brain and you interpret things. And anytime you do that, of course, you open yourself up to making massive mistakes. And so our brain was designed to recognize patterns and basically create them when they're not there, compare things that we see to understandings that we have. So familiar things and so we try to interpret unfamiliar things as familiar things because that's, you know, memory recall is part of that heuristic system. And so we make a lot of snap judgments. And then once we make those judgments, we stick with them and we interpret lots of other evidence in line with those judgments that we've already made because thinking quickly and interpreting things quickly probably saved our lives a lot when we sort of lived on the land. Uh, but right now it causes you to make poor, poor choices. So if you, you know, have you ever seen videos on YouTube of a, of a cat, like let's say a cat's eating and someone sneaks a cucumber on the, on the ground next to them and then they turn around and they see the cucumber and they jump five feet in the air. Well, that's because it's activated the snake 
subroutine in their brain, right? So the cucumber has a vague snake-like shape. So they're not scared of cucumbers, of course, but the heuristics in their brain interpreted that long slender shape on the ground as a snake. And that's the kind of things that our brains do all the time. We misinterpret information because of the heuristics. And the worst part of this, if you ask me, is, is in memory. But cognitive biases can be part of that as well. So what does that mean in terms of the volume of cat videos that you watch in order to uh, <laughs> be aware of that? I've actually never, never, never uh, seen that one before, but I'm definitely going to look yeah, out for it now. Yeah, and that's, just, you know, considering the volume of those that I watch, I, I should have yeah. run into it by now. Google cat and cucumber and you'll have a, you'll have a fun 10 minutes. <laughs> There's a lot of great videos of it. <laughs> But I mean, the thing is, humans will do that too. Just, you know, we're a little bit more controlled about it. But if you put like anything snake-like, because humans have a unique fear of snakes as well. Uh, you know, I've written articles about that as well. Um, we have that fear of snakes program running in our brain as well. So it's easy to activate. But th th mostly what I'm talking about in the book are, are things that have more, in my view, real dire consequences. So the, the power of the anecdote is one, one thing that I, I write about in the sense that you can hear a single story and you will, you will create a truth out of that, a universal truth that you will then measure all kinds of other things against that truth, no matter how many pieces of information that come in contrary to that. And I think that, that gets to our, back to our anti-vaxxers, right? Right. They heard about, they have a friend who knows somebody that this happened to them. Yes. Whether it was actually a result of the vaccine, it then becomes very personal. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they assign a lot of importance to that, right? So that then, yeah. so clearly the, this, and I actually had a, a discussion with a patient today. It wasn't about his own care. It was just, you know, we were chit chatting and he was telling me about his, um, his granddaughter, something about getting into an Uber. And then there was that unfortunate incident of the woman who got into the car that wasn't her Uber. And so now he, you know, he, he doesn't think anybody should be taking Ubers from now on. And I said, really, statistically, you know, the likelihood of something like that happen, I think it makes more sense to, for that grandchild's age group, find out what they're at actual higher risk for, and then avoid those things, right? It might be motor vehicle accidents. It might be, if it's a boy, it might, it's probably going to be something a bit more, you know, I, they just have, unfortunately, our sex has a higher mortality at a younger age, because we do dumber things. And, and then protecting against those things rather than you know, you heard a story. So I think that's, yeah. right, that's exactly what you're saying. The story is so powerful that it influences our judgment, irrespective of the statistical significance of it. That's right. And, and, and part of the reason of this is because stories resonate with us. People resonate. We connect to people. We connect to narratives. We don't connect to data. We don't have a natural intuitive sense of charts and graphs and statistics. Like that doesn't, our brain isn't sensitive to that information the way it's sensitive to a story. And what's funny is, to me anyway, so, so, so that, that's part of it, is that we connect with people and stories much more than we connect with data. What I always remind people of is every piece, data, what is data except for a large collection of individual stories? I mean, it's the same thing. It's just mountains of them. You just don't know any of those people and they don't have names to you, but they do have names and they're real people. But the other part of it is that we also have preferences on, you know, we're not neutral to this. So, when you, like, for example, we had one sh attempted shoe bomb on an airplane, and then we had massive changes to regulations about safety on, on airplanes as a result of, a, of one failed attempt. But yet, I walk down the street in New York City, and at least 75% of the drivers are texting while they're driving. They text at the stoplight. They text anytime there's any, I mean, they will be looking on their phone, actively engaging with their phone while they're driving down the street, which is... And, and how many people does that kill every single year? And yet, and I'm, I know it's against the law, but it's not enforced. I'll sit there and I'll watch a police officer, watch somebody else texting while driving, and I'll shake my head. The police officer shakes their head, and that's the end of it. And so the reason why this isn't enforced, if, if they started really, really enforcing that, what would happen? The public would get mad. Yeah, like, the real reason, reason is politics. Yeah, why are you bothering us? politics? <laughs> why are right? you it's, bothering fear, it's fear, the fear mongering mm -hmm. of the shoe bomber is what keeps those in power in power. I think, I mean, now, now we're getting into a political discussion, which is separate from your book. But no, I think, it's not. I mean, it's really not because we are political animals. And these, when we, when we get together, there's some things that we do a lot better as a group than we do as individuals. And then there's other things that we do a lot worse. And we're the mob. 
Yeah, yeah. So this this because um, we're living in much bigger groups than we ever evolved in, and that's part of it. But the other part is we yeah, we were definitely political animals, and we that politics affects how our brain works. And and I and one example I give in my book is a classic experiment was done regarding views on the death penalty, and they had these fake um, studies that they put together to watch people interpret these studies. And the same people would find weaknesses in studies that that came to a different conclusion that in those same weaknesses were in studies that they liked and rated very highly because it agreed with their conclusions. It was very clear that they were interpreting all the evidence in line with what they already believed. And these are, you know, people with interests in the issue. And you would think they'd be driven by data. They would be driven by studies of this issue. And they're absolutely not. They, it, it's the other way around. You have an opinion that you want to be true. And so you interpret evidence in line with it rather than letting the evidence drive you to the conclusion. And that brings and us... Full that's cognitive dissonance. That's right. Yeah. It's cognitive dissonance, right? The, <laughs> the idea, the idea, you can't hold two opposing ideas in your head at the same time. It's painful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's right. Is that is that? Yeah. Is that, I'm not sure that's cognitive bias. Cognitive dissonance. No. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not a classic. Well, no, it is. In uh, I think that you would that would fall under the head of. Um, so, so that's the problem with cognitive biases is that there's like literally dozens of them and they overlap a lot. So there's category errors and. Uh, I mean, there's all different kinds of ways to to think about it. And remember, these categories and words are things that we invent to just put things in nice, neat bucket. But yeah, cognitive dissonance, that's a, that's a fair way to think about it. My, so, my other favorite one is uh, is the Nirvana, is the Nirvana principle, Nirvana something where like everything has to be perfect, right? Mm-hmm. Like if it's not, if it's not perfect, then it's not okay. So you're able to find, again, vaccines, right? Like there's yeah. a, there, are, are there, are they... Are they completely 100% safe? No, we're doctors. We can't say that anything is 100% mm-hmm. safe. But you could also say the same thing about your stairwell. Your mm-hmm. stairwell is, a, people fall down the stairs and get hurt all the time. What are we going to yeah. not go down the stairs now? So yeah, yeah those, those uh, Nirvana fallacy, I think that's what it is. Right, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, but, but do you think we could actually use those, like inform the individual that this is the, name of their the bias that they're using this is how they're using it and this is why it, or or can you not use that effectively in a discussion to, yeah to so re- research on that is pretty limited and, and pretty divided the results are pretty divided because i've had that same question is what if we just educate people better about cognitive biases i know when it comes to what we call implicit bias about judgments about race and gender and things like this unconscious ways that we judge people. and that, uh, There has been a lot of evidence that if you really teach that, it can make a difference. It, it causes people to slow down a little bit when they're making certain judgments. But I don't know of research that really gets at the heart of the cognitive bias question. Because the problem is once you're convinced of something, you know, you're just refractory to it. I mean, I think if you did a lot of that with your patients, they're probably just going to pick another doctor. And I'll get a one-star Yelp review, which will <laughs> exactly. not help my practice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not... So I'm really... To be honest, I don't have a lot of good news there. I, I mean, a colleague of mine at John Jay uh, College works on memory errors. And, and I mean, some of the work that, that comes out of that lab is, is really devastating because what you'll find is that your memories can be edited retroactively in such a way that and you are completely convinced of the new version of your memory and you never remembering it, you never remember remembering it differently. I know it's a hard sentence to say, but and she, she works with like lineups. So you put, put up a lineup and, and uh, there's a witness and say, which one was the, the person? And she knows all the ways that you, her name is Professor Darren Strain, and she, you can manipulate that lineup so well so that you can convince people that someone who is totally different than the person they saw actually is who they saw. And then they're completely convinced that their memory really does get changed. And of course, who knows this better than anybody are the police officers who run the lineups. And so, you know, I don't think they know that they're, what they're doing is tricking people. Well, they think they're just helping. They think they're helping get the bad guy. But the problem is what they're really doing is creating a system where people's memories get edited. And what I mean is you clue in on things. So, you know, if somebody had a scar on their cheek and you really remember that, well, a police officer who wants you to pick the guy that they think did it will put that person up there and they'll be the only person with the scar on their cheek. You will see the scar and then you will edit your memory of the rest of the person around what you're now seeing. And you will be absolutely convinced that, oh, that's the person. I remember those blue eyes. Yeah, that's his build. He was wearing that hat. You will, all of your memories will edit around that thing that you clued in on. So the only way to and do then, it 
Line and then each time you see that person, it reinforces it, right? You're reinforcing the memory, yeah. you're reinforcing the connection. So yep. then you're more and more convinced that that was the person because now you've seen them more often than you've seen the actual perpetrator. So even if they put the two of them together, mm-hmm. you might choose the your new idea of who that person should be. Yep, yep. I mean, and there's ways around that, right? You you ask person for a description, and then you make sure that everybody in the lineup has all of the things in the description, including scars, tattoos, whatever, or you cover all those things. So everybody wears a Band-Aid on their left cheek so that the scar is hidden on the on the person, you know, who's the suspect, but also on all the other people. I mean, there's ways to do that. But how often do you think that really plays out in the police departments? Not, well, not, it's not now, as often now, as it could. <laughs> yeah, now we're, we're getting into one of the harder things in science, which is when you make a discovery, Mm -hmm. that's half the battle. Mm -hmm. Now getting it implemented, right? Mm -hmm. Like now you have to market it. You have to, you have to lobby it to the government in order to get something like that to happen in order to make that the standard. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just, it doesn't just happen. And so when, you know, when you and I signed up to be physicians and scientists, we we didn't sign up to be salesmen too. (laughs) That's right. but we have to we have to acknowledge and accept that that's like I didn't think when I when I became a doctor that I would have to really get good at selling the patient on what I think the diagnosis is because they come in thinking they had something completely different. Right. One of, one of the, one of the good examples is people come in thinking for years that they've had sinus problems because every time you know it get, it rains outside they get this pain and pressure in their head. Mm-hmm. Those patients have migraines, even though sometimes they've been diagnosed as sinus infections. I'll take an antibiotic. It gets better because their migraine went away. So yeah. but they come in <laughs> thinking that this is like I, my identity is someone that has that gets sinus infections and then and then and then they come in. So I, I have to actually sell them on the idea that uh, that they do. So I think. Wow. We'll I never to- I never have heard that. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Most people. Nine, it's something like nine out of ten or. 87%, something like that, 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 um, that are diagnosed or, or think they have their chief complaint is sinus pain or pressure. They end up actually having uh, some type of primary headache rather than an actual sinus condition. But, and that's, that's but, worse for them, right? Because of course they don't want to believe that because what the hell can you do for a migraine? Ah, um, uh, no, I've gotten very good at selling this. So we'll get, you, we're going to get back to your book in a second. But Could you do CBD? Are we allowed to talk about CBD? Because I, I, my sister takes it for her migraines and it works. <laughs> so I do have an episode. And as uh, it, it came out on uh, May 16th, which is actually the day we're recording this, on okay. CBD. But I don't think we, we got into headaches okay. specifically. Okay. But, but actually, so if you think about it, every time you get a sinus infection, if you're, you need to go to the doctor. You need to get antibiotics. If they get really bad, Sometimes you might need sinus surgery, and even that surgery surgery doesn't necessarily cure the problem. It just makes it better. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you get migraines and you find the right medication, you feel like you're getting a migraine. You take a pill. You're good. Now, that's not people that have severe, severe migraines. But those aren't the people that walk in thinking that they're getting sinus infections. Those people know they have migraines. So, so the subset that I see, it actually, it is, it is much more user-friendly because they don't have to go to the doctor when they get it. Now they just know what to take. So, okay. And I look forward to the, the CBD episode and also this discussion. Yeah. So, but let's, let's get more into, we're going to talk about the sinuses eventually. It might end up in our second episode because we're, we're, we have so much to discuss, but I want to, I want to start off with nutrition because I found that chapter of the book so interesting. The, the essential vitamins, like the, the example being vitamin C, mm-hmm. right? Well, first vitamin C doesn't boost the immune system. So I think, I think we should dispel that fallacy. I'm sure I've said that on, on other episodes. No, it, no evidence for that. <laughs> yes. Thank you for, for supporting me on that. Yeah. Uh, but it does prevent scurvy. Another situation where it took a lot of marketing for the world to adopt that. I think yeah. it was a hundred years before it was uh, implemented from when mm-hmm. it was discovered. But, but why do we need vitamin C? Let's, let's talk about that. Vitamin C, there's many interesting uh, micronutrients that, that we have this unique need for. Vitamin C, I think, is the coolest one. So you, you, you probably noticed you have to have at least some vitamin C in your diet or you will get scurvy. It's very uncommon now because there's vitamin C that's plentiful. It's fortified in various things. We, we don't ever suffer from this. But actually, scurvy is a hellscape of a disease. I mean, you, you're connected because you, you, you lose the ability to synthesize collagen. 
if you run out of vitamin C. And so and, and if without collagen, you don't have extracellular matrix. Basically, your connective tissues you fall are, apart. Yeah, you, you, you bleed out of your eyeball. I mean, it's really bad. But you notice that your dog and your cat don't need any of that. They get no citrus fruit. They can live on no fruit whatsoever and be perfectly fine. And that's because they, like the vast majority of animals, make vitamin C in their liver. And it's, you know, ascorbic acid, it's, it's an important thing, and it's made in their liver as much as they need. Why don't we? Well, it turns out in an ancestor of all primates, uh, supraprimates actually, there's a gene called GULO, l galanolactone oxidase, which is responsible for one key step in vitamin C synthesis. This gene got mutated by just a random sporadic mutation. It does happen. And she, or he, probably she, ended up to be the ancestor of the entire group of supraprimates. Well, that without that gene, you can't synthesize vitamin C. And so you might wonder, well, why the hell didn't she die? And she and her, you know, or her, her children, maybe, because it probably happened in an, in an oocyte. They should have been incapable of collagen synthesis. It should have been lethal. Well, the, the issue is they were in a climate and an area where vitamin C was abundant in their, in their diet, in their food sources. So they were getting enough of this naturally. And so the mutation essentially had no effect. It wasn't felt in their body whatsoever. Well, and that went on for a while. They, and they, were, they were living in that area. Well, when that happens, and then, of course, just through bad luck, founder effect, genetic drift, this group of animals becomes the ancestor of all primates. Well, that has profound consequences now. So it was fine then. There Wait, was hold on. You, you kind of glazed over a subject that, that actually baffled me when I, when I read the book. So I think you, you concept of genetic drift maybe explains it, but oh, yeah, what I didn't sorry. understand is that if, if that mutation doesn't lead to some improved adaptation, mm -hmm. how come it doesn't affect some of us? How come it affects all of us? I think I would think it would just be randomly dispersed throughout our population because it wasn't advantageous. It didn't lead to this individual be able to being able to have offspring that reproduced more effectively than other offspring. Right. So that, that's a very important point. You're right. I, I went right past it without explaining it. So let's, let's take a little time. So we like to think that every single thing about us that is evolved, that evolution produced was done sort of on purpose. Like it gave us an advantage and natural selection selected for it. But actually what we now know is the vast majority of genetic differences among species and populations is random. And it doesn't necessarily have, it's neutral. And it has no no benefit whatsoever. And then, as the way that speciation works is, very small populations give rise to whole groups of organisms, whole clades of organisms, and they're going to be a random sample of whatever the ancestor population is. So, in other words, populate. If you go back in our evolutionary history, you'll see bottleneck after bottleneck after bottleneck after bottleneck, where the population went down to very, very, very small size. And when that happens, randomly some genes that are the neutral versions of their genes, some alleles, get fixed into the population. So they didn't give an advantage. It just so happens that whatever else was going on with those animals, they became the founders of a whole new group. So losing the GULO gene, losing the function of the GULO gene for vitamin C synthesis didn't offer any advantage. It just got fixed in, in the population by bad luck. And this bad luck is known as genetic drift. Genetic drift just means random sampling. So when you have very small sample size, that you know it's called sampling errors. If you're looking at like you know population level stuff for political science or psychology, sampling errors means well, if you only look at a very small number of individuals, they're not going to be you know ran, they're not going to represent a larger whole. So if I were to pick ten people off the street, it might just so happen that all ten of them are over six feet tall, and then if they become the founders of a new species, it looks like that species evolved into tall things. Like there was some advantage to being tall, but it might well have just been random. <laughs> so that's what happened with the with the GULO gene is that it just randomly, there's no advantage. The fact that you don't make that particular enzyme doesn't like save you any calories or anything. It just, it's just random, just bad luck. And so this bad luck event happened that destroyed the gene, but because it didn't have any negative effect, it wasn't eliminated from the population. It hung around long enough to get fixed by accident. And it didn't have any negative effect because we happen to live in a place, those individuals happen to live in a place where citrus fruit or some source of vitamin C was plentiful. So it didn't give them a disadvantage. They didn't, they didn't just start falling apart. 
That's right. And primates evolved in the global south. And so citrus fruit wasn't an issue. But the problem is that over time, any gene that's not functional is therefore not maintained by selection, meaning it will it will accumulate additional mutations because there's never going to be any selective pressure against those mutations. And mutations are constantly happening randomly. So that Gulo gene has now been beat up by hundreds of random mutations. We can still see the gene. It's absolutely there. It has a promoter and it has exons and introns. It looks like a gene. It's sort of like a car in a junkyard. You can definitely tell it's a car. It has most of the parts, but it cannot function as a car, even a little bit because of some crippling mutations. So Gulo gene isn't expressed at all, but its remnants are there. And now because of those additional mutations, we can never fix it the odds of, of random mutations reactivating a pseudogene, and that's what these are called, or pseudogenes, is a billion to one multiple times over because each one of those mutations would have to would happen in the same individual and that kind of thing. So we're never going to resurrect this gene. It's sometimes called a dead gene or a pseudogene. What's, what's interesting about this is that GULO is, is, I think, the coolest example, but we have not hundreds, not thousands, but tens of thousands of pseudogenes in our genome. In fact, we have more non-functional genes than functional genes. You know, the current estimates are somewhere around 40 to 50,000 pseudogenes. So these are ancestral, once functional genes. Now, probably a lot of them are the result of gene duplications. So they were extra copies of things anyway. But as you can see with Gulo, not always. Please, please don't popularize that because I, I can foresee getting Google ads or, or Facebook ads across my feed for some holistic health place that wants to help you reactivate your pseudogenes and bring out the superheroes. <laughs> Take my supplements and we'll help you reactivate your pseudogenes. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if that already exists out here somewhere. <laughs> But there, the, the concept of a dead gene being resurrected already exists, actually, because there are some examples of genes that we've seen in evolutionary history. I don't think humans have any, but in other species, we've seen where a gene got inactivated by mutations and then through an incredible good luck was reactivated through, through a, a revertant mutation. And the, re, the way that you can see that is it's often not the exact same version that it once was. So the, the, the compensatory mutation is a slightly different version of what it was in the beginning. So you can see that it's become reactivated. But anyway, so that's vitamin C. So that's like the one nutrient that has this cool story. But we actually need a lot of nutrients that other animals don't. And in fact, I have made this claim and no one has yet to really come at me that I think we have the most demanding diet, uh, certainly of any primate. So we have to have a pretty wide variety of food. There's very few individual foods that you could eat only that with no supplements and no variety and be healthy. We really do need a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We need a pretty rich, varied diet. And that's not true of a lot of animals. I mean, look at the, the koala. It eats only eucalyptus leaves. I mean, they'll, they'll occasionally eat other things, but they don't have to. If you, if this, this animal can survive on only eucalyptus leaves. And there's not a single food that we can eat where we would be healthy and happy our whole lives. And what this tells us, and, and we know this a little bit just from, from uh, work in paleobiology, that we, we evolved in an environment that was very rich in lots of different kinds of food. We became foragers, first vegetarians, and then uh, scavengers, and then eventually omnivores. And we are very used to having a rich diet. So what, what happens is anytime evolution takes selective pressure off of something, functionality gets lost. So our ability to make some of these things ourselves got lost because it was constantly being served up to us nice and neat on a platter and 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 we suffered the consequences i mean vitamin b12 is another another good example so what do you think came first do you think the fact that we have such our palates are so you know you can get bored of something you don't want to eat it anymore and then you want to eat something else i'm, I'm just having trouble finding the words like our, our palates are so varied i guess yeah i mean came variety first? is the spice of life okay. right that's the, the yeah the way we think about our diet i'm so the same which way came I first well, that's a great question. My guess is, is that if, there's, if there is a biological basis to that appetite, and it's hard to know that because we eat so differently now, but if there is a biological basis to that appetite for variety, then my guess is it probably was sort of our compensation for, it sort of drove us 
to eat the very diet that we really need. And it was the best way, by the way, to get as many calories as we needed. I mean, getting calories, getting enough calories was a big challenge for most of our evolutionary history and our physiology, you know, reflects that. And so if we're going to get enough calories, we need to to, to look every, every way that we can and, and every source that we can and not really be grossed out by very many foods. And I think that that really speaks to the forager period of our, of our path. So we, we, like to, we like to think that we evolved to hunt and we eventually did. But the biggest transition in our diet was not in, towards hunting, but actually towards forage. I think, I think um, one of the just best- whatever you find, <laughs> look under the log and <laughs> so somebody first ate an egg, a chicken's egg, you know, <laughs> if that isn't oh, yeah. proof, I mean, because who, sure they who crunched on the shell. Yeah. It's like, oh, that came out of a chicken's ass. Let me see if I can eat it. I mean, only, <laughs> a, only a forager would, would have that kind of approach towards food. And I think that, but my idea about this and, and, and so far it seems to hold is that having a really rich, varied diet was actually a key part of our evolutionary history. And it made us lazy physiologically in both extracting, but really in in synthesizing things. I mean, if you look at calcium, I mean, the vast majority of people over age 50 and 60 really, really need some calcium supplementation. And the reason is they're just really bad at pulling it out of their food. Most of the, if you are over 60, most of the calcium that you consume goes right to the toilet. And, you know, that's bad design because you start taking it from your, if you don't get enough, calcium is so important for muscles and nerves and bones and uh, not bones, I'm sorry, muscles and and nerves that your heart, everything. And so you'll take it from your bones if you can't get it from your diet. And that's exactly what happens. In the book, you also discuss iron iron absorption. Yeah. Iron is is plentiful, but our ability to absorb it is equally, is equally terrible. It is. And it doesn't make any sense really whatsoever, except if you think that it was never a problem in the past because we were eating this way. And and it interacts with calcium in a weird way in our gut. So absorbing both at the same time is a problem, even though they're different importers. It's just, it's, it's funny to me, but we live in a, in a society now where getting a nice, rich, healthy diet actually isn't so hard. And so if you eating a balanced diet actually isn't really that difficult, I think. But I have a, an appetite for fruit and vegetables, so maybe maybe some people don't. <laughs> I think B12 is the coolest one, though, because you actually can absorb vitamin B12. The problem is that you absorb it in your small intestine instead of your large intestine. And your large intestine is chock full of bacteria that are making vitamin B12 for you. I mean, that's not why they do it, but they secrete it, cobalamin, and you don't absorb it in the right place. So uh, you, you eliminate B12 that's actually made for you in the large intestine rather than absorb it but you can absorb it in your small intestine. So but vitamin B12 is the one micronutrient that vegans really have to worry about a little bit because there's the plant form of cobalamin isn't, uh, we can't absorb that at all. We need animal sources of vitamin B12. And it's just so frustrating if you think about it because we actually have a large intestine you know, with tons of B12 in it. And again, we send it to the toilet rather than absorbing it. Um, <laughs> we should. We, I don't think we should try starting to retrieve it from there. Uh, well, there, so, believe it or not, there is a study that a human feces is a dietarily sufficient source of vitamin B12. So I don't recommend that to vegans or anyone else. <laughs> but crap. if you're really desperate, listen, uh, raw water has become a thing. So <laughs> I'm sure the next thing is eating your own poop. Well, my my well, idea was to sell 10x water to campers, but I, that, that idea hasn't taken off yet. But Sorry, 10x water? <laughs> yeah, concentrated water. Just If you just add water, <laughs> you, know, so you don't have to carry a whole liter. Just carry 100 mLs of 10x water, and then you fill up the rest with water that you find, and, and, and you get a liter. <laughs> so so, so we, we've got a whole bunch of product ideas that are, <laughs> that are really not a little nefarious uh, that are coming out of this conversation. So, so you talked about not being able to absorb iron, not being able to absorb calcium, not being able to, for B12 being in the wrong part of the gut to be able to absorb it efficiently, Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's made in the gut by bacteria, vitamin C we can't make. Then we have essential fatty acids that we have to consume instead of being able to make, whereas we can make other fatty acids. We can't make our own, all of our own amino acids. We can make some, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. So you you discuss those in the book as well. So we're, we're we're not so efficient at, were, I guess, from our own design, because we were so great at hunting and gathering, gathering, I guess, primarily, that we had so much in our diet that we didn't need to be able to produce these, these things. I think 
the best example of the variety of our diet is probably the Costco and Rego Park. <laughs> for, any, for any New Yorkers, if you have the opportunity, don't go on a Sunday. But if you go to the Costco and Rego Park, it is the intersection of so many ethnicities and nationalities. You will hear so many languages being spoken, and they cater to that population. So you will find food from every place around the world. And I think that's a great example of how, how varied our diet is is and needs to and apparently needs to be yeah no that's a great example too because uh, it's in queens i live in queens and it is the most international borough or neighborhood in the world i mean it's it's uh, you you can't get more diverse than than queens new york and if you look at those cuisines though it's really interesting because you know there's a lot of common themes that come into it so a lot of the the, the challenges that we've had dietarily have grown you know cultures have all grown up around this and then what happened in industrialization is a lot of foods got simplified and some of the nutrients got stripped out. So the, the classic example is, is rice polishing. And so beriberi, barely heard of this in the developed world, but beriberi is a deficiency of vitamin B1, thiamine, right? And it was discovered, they thought it was an infectious disease because it was, um, you know, they'd find it in... Um, outbreaks of it, as they would call it. Uh, but actually what they're finding is if you polish the rice and you remove the rice husk uh, to make white rice, you're actually removing all of the, the vitamin B1. And so you have huge regions of Asia where rice was a staple uh, and they never got berry berry until they got industrialized. And uh, you might have heard of the story uh, in, in a prison, and I forget what, where it was. I, I want, it might have been Australia, where they had outbreaks of berry berry, but not among the, pop, not among the prisoners, among the guards and the staff. Because the guards and the staff got white rice and the prisoners were felt unpolished brown rice to those dirty prisoners. That was the idea. But the, what they really what they were doing was poisoning themselves, not poisoning, but uh, they were giving themselves a vitamin deficiency in the process. So so and, and that's just one small example of how the processing of our food makes it way less healthy. And so even though, you know, I believe in, I cook my food and I, I buy some packaged stuff, but the, the general rule of eating whole fresh food as an alternative to, to package and process, that's a pretty good rule. <laughs> you're, you're always going to get better nutrition and less pointless starch if you eat whole fresh food. So that, that's good advice for anybody. Yeah, I think for all those med students out there that are that are listening to this episode, I think they're going to get the berry berry question right on the test. Yeah, because like you said about anecdotal, you know, you, they now have a, a prison based story to attach right. to that fact, so they're gonna they're gonna remember that. Yeah, and I think you just made a great argument for something that that the population says that physicians don't do, but we really do. We think that people should eat mostly plants most of the time. <laughs> and and a good variety of them, right? Mostly plants, most of the time, and and minimally processed. I think that's a good a good idea. So we're 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 running out of time here because I, I do want to let you get back to all the things that you are very very busy doing. But I just want to ask you about first the Pleist Pleistocene era uh -huh. versus the Paleolithic era, right? Because a lot of people are talking about the Paleo diet. So one. Shouldn't it be the Pleistocene diet and not the Paleo diet? And second, what really what is the real Paleo diet? Because you discussed that in, in the book, and I thought it was really interesting, especially for people that are anti-GMO. Right. Well, so the word Paleo as applies to diet, I can't even make sense of it because pa Paleo just means old. So I, I assume they mean Paleolithic. And and if you're talking about the 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 Paleolithic means the older part of the Stone Age. So the beginning of the Stone Age was when we started to make tools is usually the, and it, it occurred during the Pleistocene. So the Pleistocene is actually a geological age. It's actually an epoch. And Paleolithic has to do with human, it's an anthropology term. So we're sort of two different disciplines there. So Pleistocene is a geographical, or sorry, geological time period. And Paleolithic has to do with, so Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic have to do with what humans were doing during that time. So with Paleolithic, it's not so much of an issue because we're mostly just talking about Africa and sometimes the Near East, but really Africa. But Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic have different time periods in different parts of the world as humans adopted technology at different time. So, but that wouldn't be, but Pleistocene is a geological age. Got it. So that's why it's a little bit different. But Pleistocene covers all the way, you know, covers almost the entire, well, basically all of the Pale Paleolithic and it gets us up to the Pliocene, which is the most recent uh, epoch. So, so what is a real paleo diet? If you want to eat like 
Paleolithic man when you first started creating tools, what would you be eating? So, so this is the problem is that if you go back to the earliest part of the Paleolithic, it's a very different story than if you go to the end of the Paleolithic. So which Paleolithic diet are you talking about? That's the question. Let's uh, go with the most appealing, the most appealing. Okay. Let's, let's later, later Paleolithic. Well, I was going to start with the least appealing. So I, I, I think that sure. they, the biggest transition in our diet uh, was when we went from veg- being vegetarians to being scavengers. And then hunting came after that. But the ability to, to tolerate a meat-based diet really happened with scavenging first. I think, um, and in fact, me and many others believe that bone marrow was the first sort of animal-based project, a uh, product, not product, a uh, food source that was uh, an important part of the, of the, because bone marrow was somewhat of an untapped resource. So if you, you can imagine a large, you know, megafauna, like a big mammal, that gets taken down. Well, humans are not fighting off lions for any of the meat, right? But what they could do that a lot of other animals couldn't do was crack the long bones while they're still fresh and hard, and then they would get really nutrient-rich bone marrow. So there's a lot of calories in bone marrow. There's a lot of nutrients. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great food. So the transition from purely plant-based diet to animal-based diet probably began actually with bone marrow and then grubs. So that's right. If you want to eat a paleo diet, you want to eat some bone marrow. You want to eat worms and grubs. And then the plants that, that they ate were nothing like the plants that we eat now, right? So fruits would have been small, fibrous, bitter. There would have been a lot of leaves and there would have been roots. And actually the ability to dig was a key part of our transition as well. So because we can see a certain kinds of plants and know, oh, there's going to be roots underneath here that are nutritious and, and, and rich. But remember, all of this was uncooked. So if you want a paleo diet, it has to be raw. raw and you try eating a raw uh, tuber, a raw potato, a raw uh, yam even. And even now, of course, they're much softer than they were then. And it still would be very difficult for you. So if you want to eat a true paleo diet, good luck. But you're going to spend three or four hours a day chewing. Uh, which is what our ancestors did. We know that because of the way that their their muscles, their muscles were, their jaw muscles were huge because they spent so much time chewing. You're chewing leaves, you're chewing sticks, you're chewing bark, and then you're lucky enough to get bone marrow here and there. All of this would have been raw. Now, the invention of cooking changed everything, right? Because it made meat, you were able to take large amounts of meat very quickly and get most of the nutrients out of it. It's just not true. We don't have good teeth for meat eating right now. If you ever eat, eat a, like a raw steak, you shouldn't do that really. But if you do, you're not going to get much out of it. If you eat a raw steak, it's usually chopped up really finely for you. You get it, you get it at a fancy restaurant, right? And it's, uh, it's sliced really, really thin. Yeah, that's about the only way you can take it. So uh, cooking changed sort of everything. And that really facilitated that transition to hunt, eventually hunting. And, and we became persistence hunters, long distance uh, uh, running and, and persistence hunting. And that was key. But the key part of, of the paleo diet, so what I like about most diet fads is that, you know, the majority of the logic that they present is, is wrong. <laughs> it makes no sense. But there's all, often bits of good diet in there. So like people, the South Beach diet or the Atkins diet or the Mediterranean diet, basically what they all come down to in, in terms of the value of it is, like you said, eat less, mostly plants, avoid processed stuff, or avoid sugar as much as you can, avoid carbohydrates as much as you can, and you'll be fine. And also eat less often. That's another thing that we're, the, the data uh, uh, behind intermittent fasting is really encouraging. So even people that are eating more calories per week, if they, if they eat it in a lot fewer meals, are showing weight loss and higher energy and some alleviation of some symptoms because it seems to be that long periods of fasting, 12 to 18 hours, uh, at least three times a week, if you, if you can't do it more, um, seems to make a big difference. And I have a, not, it's not my theory, but what I, what I believe is that it's inflammation actually. So eating constantly, the way we do, like the first thing you do is eat and you eat all the way till night. I don't think we were designed to do that. And I think inflammation, uh, global inflammation is much higher if you're just eating all day. Uh, well, but if you, Mm-hmm. You bring that up. You bring that up in your book, right? You you say that we are designed to live on the brink of starvation. Yeah, feast and famine. Feast and famine. We were we were built to tolerate long periods of not eating and then gorging, but we're t- so that's how we're built. But we're trained now by dietitians who've been shoving down our throats. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, try finding a study that actually backs that up. 
they don't exist. They, that was never based on any solid science. In dietetics, by the way, I hope there's no dietitians listening to this, but it's, it's a field that has led us astray since its inception. It's never been very scientific. It's always been a bunch of people and their hunches and their preferences. And then it became, it's now because of anthropology and more importantly, public health, who takes an unbiased look where they just say, okay, let's see how a bunch of people eat and which ones are more healthy than the others. And let's see what we can learn. So that's like the exact opposite of what dietetics does. And when you have that kind of information, you actually learn from it. So intermittent fasting, no one sat around and said, let's try this. They just discovered it. And among people who seem to be able to keep weight off, even though they eat like hell, it's because they don't eat breakfast and they skip lunch a lot. So if you want to be healthy, avoid carbs and sugar the best you can. Don't have dessert, at least not every day. Skip breakfast every day if you can and skip lunch as often as you can. That and was me during residency. Yeah. That was me during residency. You're and just you know, too, you're too tired to wake up and eat breakfast. You get to work. You have no time for lunch. At the end of the day, you're too tired to eat. So you, uh, yeah. so you go to, you go to sleep rather than eat. And, uh, next thing you know, it, your resident, your co-resident turns to you and says that that skinny dork that I knew was hiding under there is starting to come out again. Yeah, exactly. You get a direct life. quote. Yeah. And if you would be sleeping properly, you'd actually probably have a healthy lifestyle there. But I don't imagine you slept much as a resident. <laughs> no, 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 not not at all. And actually, I, I remember uh, reading a study about rats that when, when they were kept close to starvation tended to live a lot longer, which which really supports what you're saying as, as well. Yeah, yeah. So that was the beginning of the the caloric restriction I don't want to say craze, but the caloric restriction really took off with those with the rodent studies, both rice and mat, uh, both uh, mice and rat. <laughs> if they calorie deprived them, they would live you know quite a bit longer, fifty percent longer in some cases. Now that's never been they've never been able to reproduce that in larger animals, and there's a reason why, of course, smaller animals with their metabolism being so much faster would be more sensitive to that. But what we have seen is that the one thing that centenarians all have in common is that they're small. You know, just, just being small in stature and thin your whole life does really add, add years to your life, at least on average. But what I'm really excited about the intermittent fasting, because I, I, basically it validates how I've always eaten. I never eat breakfast. Does there have cognitive bias involved in there? Exactly, exactly. I finally found data. To, but, but my thing is that I did. I, uh, I, cherry I, picking. But see, what I thought was I thought I was bad by not eating breakfast. Like I would always be like, I know I should eat breakfast. I just don't. So I really was, was, had been brainwashed in the other direction against what I was doing. But I, I, breakfast never agreed with me. I never felt good in the morning if I ate. So I quit. Well, that's cause, also because most breakfast is trash. Exactly. Right. It's all sugar it's, and carbs. It's, it's and, dessert. It's dessert yeah, that was right. modified to look like a meal. You're absolutely right. We Americans especially have the worst yeah. breakfast food. It's really, it's atrocious. And wow. actually this, this segues into what I want to start the next episode is with, which how obesity is actually adaptive. So we're not, we're not going to talk about it now because we're, mm -hmm. we're out of time. The next episode, we're going to be talking about obesity. We're going to be talking about some ENT specific interests for me and my colleagues, some orthopedic issues and some OBGYN issues, all, um, all about how, all of the inefficiencies that the human body has developed and uh, why we're not the quite the well oil machined. And yet the whole idea behind your book is yet we've managed to push past that and thrive and become the dominant species on the planet. Yeah, Brad, we have a lot to talk about still, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> might, it might end up in three episodes if you're willing, if you're willing to take the time. So. Sure, yeah, I have fun doing this. And I always so learn something. I've never, I've never done one of these interviews and not learned a lot in the process. So I, I think it's worth it. <laughs> All right. I'm glad. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I could teach you something. So uh, to teaching the professor. So Professor Nathan Lentz, where, where can people find you? Where can we find you online? Where can we find your podcast? Oh, great. Well, so if you Google Nathan Lentz, I'm pretty, I think I'm the only Nathan Lentz that's out there doing stuff on the internet, at least for now. So if you, I'm on Twitter, I'm on, I do have a Facebook page. I'm not very good about it, but I, um, if you find me on Twitter is the best, but also I have a blog, it's the human evolution blog. And I only put out about an article a month. I try not to be too overwhelming for people. So yeah, my blog, human evolution blog, Twitter, what else? Oh, my, my podcast is called This World of Humans. And it, it looks at some of the stuff we've been talking about today, but I, I focus on other people's work, not my own. 
and I bring them in. And that that podcast only does about an episode a month, but starting next fall, we're gonna we're gonna ramp it up because I got a new funding stream coming in. So this world of humans, if you like podcasts, it's another good one about sort uh, of social science, biology, sort of how how our biology affects us. Anything that catches my interest along those lines. This is the audience to plug podcasts, Sue. Yeah, great. It's I love them. I, I listen to a whole bunch, including yours now. So I'm, well, glad, you. I'm glad you found me. All right. Well, th- this has been a, a great conversation. I, I learned a ton stuff that I'm going to be able to apply in my own practice. Definitely give my patients a little perspective on on what's going on with the human body, uh, especially with regard to some of the, the vitamin deficiencies that come up. So really, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. It has been a pleasure. You bet. Thank you. And uh, look forward to the next chat. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.